for it to start recording and then I'll I'll pronounce it. There we go. So I've shared my screen. I'm on um, page 1.2. Folks in the chat voted to have a little bit of a lecture for 1.2. I'm going to maximize my computer screen here so you can see everything. Oh, the slides for most of these and um, the um, slides for most of these are right at the top of the, the page and they're just HTML slides. And so any of you watching live who would like to look at it on your own computer, you can open them up in a browser or, um, you know, that's where they are for later. And uh, up here, there is a YouTube link that has recordings for for most of the bootcamp pages associated with our R users group. You can browse on there and it's the Herrig meetings. There are two kinds of bootcamp lectures on that YouTube um, link. Some of them are for our Herrig meetings where it's live and me um, answering questions sometimes and changing between screens and doing various things. A few of the lectures I have done recordings that are just the lecture, but there aren't, aren't very many of those, but almost all of the lectures are up on the YouTube channel um, for most of the bootcamp pages, just, just in case you want to do it. So he, this will be another one, which I'll also put up there and I'll link this one uh, somewhere. <clears throat> Okay, so if we just open up the slides, it's just 1.2 slides. And then just back out a little bit. There we go. So, um, well, there's some jargon that we have to learn. I, I guess I could apologize for the jargon, but um, this this jargon is not gratuitous. It's um, it's jargon that serves a purpose and it's helpful. So we're going to learn about what functions are and what packages are. Um, in R. <clears throat> now, I like metaphors, and uh, I use them a lot in my teaching. Maybe it's because I'm American. I, I use a lot of idiomatic expressions. Um, I like to say that I use them ironically, and I think that's mostly true, but the older I've gotten, uh, the more conscious I've come of, um, you know, forgetting the ironic part. But uh, with a little bit of irony, I use this metaphor for R as a garage. Okay, here's the metaphor. Um, a garage has, uh, it's a place where we build things and do work. And a garage has toolboxes in it. And in the toolboxes are tools that allow us to do that work more efficiently and, and easier. And uh, in R, <clears throat> when we install R uh, for the first time, we have a set of toolboxes in there. And in there, are a set of tools. Well, the language in uh, the R language, the jargon in the R language for what a toolbox is, is that it is a package. Uh, and inside each package, the tools are individual functions. And uh, <clears throat> R comes with a whole set of toolboxes and tools. Now, the typical way to learn about all these packages and tools is we, we don't we don't spend a lot of time learning specifically what any of them are until we need them. And then we have to learn how to use those tools. And sometimes we have to remember what toolbox they're in. But we don't have to memorize anything at first. We just wait till we need it and then we can learn about it. Now, a neat thing about R and uh, to extend this metaphor a little bit. Is that. Um, when we want to do something that's uh, that that is beyond that that standard set of tools that we have, um, there's a huge community uh, of scientists and statisticians and uh, and other scientists, just like you guys, who have invented tools to make their own life easier, and they've shared them straight on to make your life easier. Again, there's a little cost to tap into this huge community um, in that you have to learn, you know, what tool you might need, what tool might be useful that someone else has created. But at, but at the moment, not to not to overwhelm you, but um, at the moment, there are well over 10,000 toolboxes, 10,000 packages, all of them filled with with tools, with functions. So we're going to learn about how that system works. 
today on this page. <clears throat> so the first thing we're going to do is just uh, talk about functions and how they work in R. They have a lot of little idiosyncrasies to them. It's one of the hard things on the steep learning curve to learn R for the first time, so we'll talk about them. We're going to um, talk about how to make use of functions, how you actually use them so that they do what you want them to do and they have predictable behavior, and also how to get help with them. Because your first, your first, uh, even if I tell you, hey, I want you to use the the LM function, you're going to say, okay, great, Ed told me to use the LM function. Now, how do I use the LM function? Well, we have to learn how to get help. So I'll show you that system and we'll start using that right away. We'll talk about our packages, the ones that aren't yet in your garage, how to get them and how to load them up. And uh, that's that's the whole that's the whole thing that we're going to do. So we think of um, functions as the tools that do work for us. This work could be anything. It could be calculating descriptive statistics, like you have a variable, and say you've measured the the weight of um, <clears throat> of um, wheat seeds, and uh, you want to calculate the mean. Well, we would use the function called mean to calculate the mean to do that work for us. Now, every R function has a name, has an open round bracket and a closing round bracket. <clears throat> and uh, to manipulate how the um, function works, inside the brackets are a series of arguments. So they're just names for placeholders for um, for information, instructions that you pass to the function to, to modify what it does. Now, a lot of times this is very easy to use, and for basic functions, we can ignore the arguments. We, we often have to specify what data we want the, the function to do work to. Um, so there'll be an argument that we set to the name of a data object in R, but oftentimes, um, if you want to do something a little more complicated, there might be other arguments in there, and there might be a whole lot of them, and um, all of them may have defaults except for the data argument. Uh, so sometimes we can ignore them and go with the defaults, but this is the structure of it. Every function has a name. Every function must have the opening and closing brackets. There's no space between the name and the, and the bracket there. Notice that. There's no spaces in the function name either. Uh, and then there are lots of arguments. The little dot, dot, dot down here implies that there may be more arguments, maybe a lot more. And notice that every argument and the value that it's set to um, is separated by a comma. And then the last little thing I'll point out, Lucy mentioned that there's the crazy little symbol, the less than symbol and the dash that we call the assignment operator. Now, a lot of times people observe, why don't we just use equals? Why don't we just use equals instead of this stupid arrow? But uh, in the R world, we reserve the equals sign for arguments. So argument, we use an equal sign for arguments inside functions to set values to arguments. And we use that assignment operator that's the less than and dash outside of functions. <clears throat> now, um, you, you really have two problems uh, when you start using R to, to do anything sensible or to do anything that is worth doing. One is um, that the, and, uh, the two things that I'm about to, to say are they assume that you know what you want to do in the first place with your data. So, let, you know, you want to calculate the standard deviation. So, assuming you know that and that you do want to do that. <clears throat> um, the first thing you have to do is, well, what what function name do I need to use to uh, or do I need to discover that will do that work for me? And then the second thing is, how do I use that function? So uh, we're, we're not going to talk about how you discover what function you want to use yet. So maybe uh, when you're starting to use R, you um, 
when you're first starting, maybe uh, someone has, has suggested a particular function for you to use. <clears throat> Uh, like in this case, if you want to calculate the standard deviation, maybe someone suggested for you to use the SD function, stands for standard deviation. But your second problem, you still have the second problem. How do I use it? Well, the way we get help is um, we use the help function. The name of the function is help, and it's got an argument called topic. And we would use it to get help on the SD function by setting the topic equal to the name, SD. And uh, if we do that, we get a um, standard help page. I'll demonstrate this in a second in our studio, so you can see. I'll, and I'll, when I demonstrate it, by demonstrating it, I'll, I'll also at the same time demonstrate how I intend you to interact with the um, the, the page <clears throat> and every page. When you use this, you get a page that looks like the ugliest web page in the whole world. You've never seen such a thing, but a a thing that you will want to, it's worth trying to get used to viewing these pages and getting the information out of them and overcoming the shock of initially seeing how ugly they are as web pages because they're very useful. And I would go on even further and say that they're essential to uh, get over that learning curve as fast as possible, the faster you can accept this. So here's what I use them for. I still use them every day. I've been using R for over 20 years, still use the help page uh, almost every R session unless I'm doing something so bone trivial um, that uh, that I, I've memorized every single thing. Very rarely do that. So at the top of every help page is uh, the name of the, uh, this is a picture, so I can't highlight it, but it's the name of the function, This, in this case, the SD function. In curly braces is the name of the package or the toolbox that that tool lives in. In this case, it's the stats package. Stats package is one of the standard ones in R. We don't really care about that for learning how to use the um, SD function. We have a title of what the function does and a description of what it does. In this case, the description is that the function computes the standard deviation of the values in X. Okay, what is X? <laughs> That's our second question. <clears throat> so we have... Uh, in this case, the, the SD function, the standard deviation function, is a pretty simple function. It only has um, two arguments. It only has x, and it has one called na.rm. And um, under the usage section, uh, if an argument is named and it has a value next to it, so this has na.rm set to false, that tells us that the um, na.rm is false by default. So it tells us the default setting. So that's something you can actually change. And if you did read this part up here, it says, well, if it's true, then missing values in your in your vector of data are removed before computation proceeds. And I'll, I'll demonstrate it if I remember or have an example uh, when we go to our studio. I'll demonstrate how to manipulate that and how that works. Um, but uh, we still have the problem. Well, what exactly, if, it, if this is any old function, what is, what is X and what is NA.RM? Well, we have a dictionary that defines what they are. Every help page is exactly like this. So under arguments, we can see that X is just a numeric variable. It's just a vector of data that, uh, that you specify that you want the standard deviation calculating. So it's an R object. And na.rm is logical, true, false, zero, one. And it answers the question, should missing values be removed? So that's the basics of how we use the help menu. <clears throat> now, um, this is an important one. I'll, I'll say it and I'll try to reiterate it when we start the module and, you know, for as we get further into the boot camp. But... Um, for any problem that, for many years, any statistical problem that I have, that I have encountered in R, someone has already created a package and a tool to solve it for me. And I have created my own statistical analysis tools, you know, over the years of a career as a biostatistician. And even so, these days, R makes it so easy that um, 
I tend not to have to create any of my own tools anymore. I just have to find the tool that somebody else has created. And when I started using R, the community was fairly small, but very intense. And uh, even then, many, many there were so many useful tools, you just had to find it. And the way that in the early days of R using that we um, communicated with each other was on the internet, but it was the, I'm sad to say, it was in the early days of the internet. And um, it wasn't as easy because the community was smaller and the way the internet worked and, and social media, much social media that exists today didn't exist then. Yet, it was super useful. All you had to do was reach out to the community, often directly in those days, and find it. These days, the way you find um, a tool, if you need to find a tool that solves a problem, um, you would Google for it. <clears throat> I, I would do the same. In the past, we wouldn't Google for it. <clears throat> Instead, we would um, go to the um, R statistics message boards. And we would post a question. This is similar to Reddit or Reddit for statisticians, or it would be similar to uh, one called Stack Overflow that's a, a techie one. And uh, we would get an answer directly from, usually directly from the community member who made a tool. Well, um, Google was really good for a while, but uh, now there's an extra problem for students that are just learning this stuff. And it, it's a hard problem, and I don't have a good solution for this problem, but I wanted to, I wanted to make you aware of it <laughs> right away, is that uh, Google, it turns out, is, is not as effective as it used to be for finding out how to get help with R now. <clears throat> For most of the course that we go through, I'll just I'll just already suggest functions for you to use, and I, I will expect you to focus on the functions that I introduce to you. When you Google for functions these days, so many people have created so many different tools that you're overwhelmed with choice, and it's a particular problem when you're learning. So uh, I would ask you to, when you're finding tools, it's better to ask someone you know than it is to just blindly Google for something. That frustrates me a little bit because it's it's our inclination these days to Google for it. But but that's your first problem. You have to find uh, what function and what toolbox the tool is in, unless unless you're told that. <clears throat> um, so I I basically uh, just said this, and I also gave the warning warning about uh, Google. But <clears throat> there will be some tools that we'll use uh, in the boot camp and in the module where we will want to install packages. And this is one of the greatest utilities uh, that R has. <clears throat> to install a package, if we know which one we want to install, we, uh, we first we have to download it uh, from the internet and there's an official safe repository that this function draws from that is those 10,000 plus um, toolboxes that others have created. And we just specify the name of the package in quotes. And it will download and install that package, just the ones you need, just when you need them. Uh, and it, it'll do so locally, automatically, almost always without error. Now, a peculiarity of R <clears throat> is that when you're downloading a set of tools um, from the internet, it's referred to as a package. But when it, when it has been downloaded and it is local on your computer, we refer to it as a library. And so to load the library, and then th this, the metaphor is to open the toolbox so that you can have access to the tools, we use the library function. So we would tend to um, use the install.packages function the first time that we're going to use a tool in a toolbox. But um, between our sessions, we would have to load and open up that toolbox every single time, even if we had already downloaded it. So we only do this one once. This one we do every time we want to use the package in a new script. This um, page is, uh, if I just back out of the slides here, <clears throat> and if I just go back to, um, the boot camp page 
<clears throat> now I intend all of these to um, to be uh, a thing that you're reading through the information. I'm just going to make this a bit bigger, and uh, perhaps I'll make my screen like that. <clears throat> Some of them, and especially these first couple of pages, are a lot of reading just to give you the idea of what we're going to be doing. But I believe there is a little bit of coding in this one. So I'm not going to read through um, this whole page. I've just, I've just um, um, in the lecture outlined what it contains in any case. There are clickable um, content sections that we can click. Talk about the function name. Talked about the way functions have arguments. They're separated by commas, and there might be a lot of them. I have uh, given you some examples of some common function names. Mean, log, that takes the natural base log. SD for standard deviation. Plot, we used to draw plots. Box plot, we used to draw box plots. And help. But when you get to blocks of code, these are places where I intend you to um, have your own version of RStudio local up. Now, some of you may have noticed that um, at the top of every page also, I, I initialize a script. So I intend you to download the separate script and save it, save your work as you type and do your own work. So I'll demonstrate what I mean by that. I'm just gonna right click this script, save as, This one I'm just going to um, download to my downloads folder, but I think it would be, a, um, in fact, I'll just go ahead and demonstrate that I think it's best practice to pick a place where you want to save these scripts. And uh, so you might make a folder, and the folder might be called something like C7041-labs. <clears throat> and uh, inside that, save the script-1.2. I'm just going to open that. It'll pop up with our studio. You should still be able to see this. And if you read the first, um, <clears throat> the first uh, boot camp page, you would have already, if you got through it and survived, you would have already installed R in our studio. Can I? Can I? Uh, are there any questions so far? Has anyone had trouble? Could anyone? say that they've encountered uh, trouble with R and R Studio. Because we can help you tonight. If uh, there is anybody in that case, it's still struggling. If nobody speaks up, I don't want to make you identify yourself as having had trouble, but um, do get help if you if you do need to. I will explain what arguments are. We'll we'll look through them as I go through this this page in the script. Sure. Absolutely. I'll do it with the uh, the mean function as we go through this example. <clears throat> so um, there are a couple of tools. I'll assume that everybody has the latest version of R Studio and R installed. If you haven't, it might be worth considering updating. Unless you have a good reason not to, I would recommend it. Um, <clears throat> I advocate having a header block where you update your name. And uh, I'm just going to make this a little bit bigger. Let's make it easier to see for you. Um, I'll just go ahead and leave the link to the thing here. What is it? This is, you know, a package. 1.2 functions and packages. I've already filled that in for you. Best practice to um, um, put the date on the last time, time you update stuff. And I've suggested a format for the date, which is the internationally accepted standard for formatting dates. <clears throat> the year, four digit dash month, two digit dash day, two digit. I think today's the 27th. And I also advocate a table of contents. Now, <clears throat> I mentioned a little bit in that first um, Bootcamp, the syntax that in R, we tend to leave breadcrumbs in our scripts with um, the hash symbol. And anything on a line that's after a hash symbol isn't considered code by the, uh, by the interpreter 
or if you read the web page, my metaphor for the interpreter is the passive aggressive butler. So it won't confuse the butler if you write some notes to yourself and it's best practice to write quite a lot of them. But in in this syntax where I have a um, two hashes, some text and then a, a four hashes at the end, this is syntax to make a clickable table of contents, an index that's clickable. You can access that by this little symbol up here in the upper right hand corner of the script window. I just click it. <clears throat> I've got these links that allow me to navigate through this script. I can also access it a second way from down here in this little section. So that's something you, uh, it's best practice to use that as well. So I, I follow that convention for all of these little scripts that I've made for you. And I've got one um, little section in each um, contents entry for each section in my web page. So function tour, 1.21, 1.21 function tour. Using functions and getting help, 1.22, 1.22 using functions and getting help. This happens to be the section that is the first section that has code. So um, we'll, we'll look at the arguments for the mean function, but we'll do that when we get down to when we use it for the first time. So let me just do a few things. Now there's a lot of comments in here and I emphasized um, in the first boot camp that I intend for you to type this stuff. You can, I can't stop you from copying and pasting it, but I have never met somebody who will learn it faster uh, if they copy and paste it. They'll always learn it slower. So I advocate typing it. You, it will take you time, but you will learn it faster. So I'm going to demonstrate the uh, typing of it. <clears throat> so one point um, 2.1 is the section here, and this is just information for you to read. There's no code, but in 1.22, we've got this code block, so I intend you to uh, to read it. Now, you can you can go through this code any way you wish, um, up to and including. I can't stop you from copying and pasting it, but I recommend you type it and use comments. These are my comments. You should write your own comments, things that explain it to yourself. And if you encounter a problem, make a comment that I just don't understand this. I need to ask Ed or one of the demonstrators in the help session what the heck this means. That's what you want to use this for. So I'm going to briefly demonstrate this so that I don't suck up all of our time tonight for 1.22. So um, <clears throat> up here, what I've advocated is a workflow for doing any work in R using your first function. And I've also advocated this concept of making pseudocode. What is pseudocode? So in pseudocode, you have some work to do. Okay, could be that I ask you to calculate the mean of, of a vector. That's the code that Ed has asked me to do. <clears throat> well, what pseudocode is in your own human language, what the steps you may have to go through it to get a the uh, R interpreter to do that work for you. And it's just in your own words. And um, the thing, the value of pseudocode when you're learning a scripting language is that it allows you to logically think about what has to be done and then set aside the problem of having to learn the R code that actually does it. So it separates those two things. So first you think logically, second you think of the code. So I just demonstrate this. Um, as a tool we may come back to. So the overall task here is to calculate the mean for a vector of numbers. So we might, in pseudocode, we might break that down into one step. We need to code in and enter the numbers to create the vector. Uh, step two, we may need to calculate the mean. And here I'm, I'm telling you what functions to use to create the, the vector we might use the function C. So I'm telling it to you. You don't need to worry about, about um, what function to use. And here I'm suggesting you use the function mean. You don't need to worry about discovering what function to do. And here, um, a step might be to plot the data. And again, I suggest to use a particular function for it, box plot. So I'm just intending you to, uh, to try out this data <coughs> entry 
and the use of the function for yourself. So uh, in this one, I'm just going to um, delete the code that I've already put in there for you and just do it in real time with you. <clears throat> so we're going to code a, a vector of data. Um, now here I um, have just used the function to encapsulate some specific numbers. So uh, I've suggested to use the C function. E here, there's a little bit of a mystery. I think it stands for concatenate, but it might stand for combine. So it uses the word combine, but I've 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 seen a talk where um, one of the creators of R was, um, you know, saying that it was actually for concatenate, but it's it's a little bit of a mystery in the R world. But it's a function that we use all the time to combine numbers, and we can read a little bit about it. And all the, all we have to do to use it is to uh, make the function name. If you're going to use a function and you know it, we always just write the name and we write the uh, open brackets. And uh, you notice when I type the open bracket, R Studio automatically talk, typed the closing bracket for me. So listen for the click, open bracket, three, two, one. I didn't type the second bracket, it just automatically closed it for myself. The numbers I've suggested are two, six, seven, eight point one five six with commas in between. Two, six, seven, eight point one, five, six. <clears throat> now, if we submit that, I've just got my cursor on the line and the, the, um, the uh, hot key combination for submitting code when your cursor is on a particular line is control enter. That's on Windows, it's, I think it's Apple control enter on Macs, if anybody's using a Mac. So I'm just going to um, submit this code to the interpreter. Three, well, you can look down in the console to see it come out. Three, two, one. And all it does is print out the, um, the name of the function. Now there are no arguments to use in the concatenate one, but now we're going to use mean and we'll look at those arguments that I promised. <clears throat> so here I'm telling you, use the mean function. What do we do every time we use a function? For the first time, well, I think we should use the help function on it. We've already looked at the help page for um, for the mean. We know that it's got a an argument called x. Now arguments are little variables that only live inside functions. That's the way that you can think about them. And the, every one of those little variables has a value. Some of them have default values. But one of the main ways that we interact with R is we manipulate the values of those functions. The main way that we manipulate the values of the functions is to um, say to, to pass our data to them. And here the, the X argument lives inside the mean function. We're on the, we're on the mean help page. And all that it is is it's a numeric vector. It's just the data you want to calculate the mean of. And the way that we use that <clears throat> is we type the name of the function we want to use in open bracket, three, two, one, close brackets made for me. Inside of that, we're going to specify our data using the x argument. x equals our data. I'm going to recycle my vector that I made up there, copy, paste. And if I uh, submit that, now there are some other arguments here. There's one called na.rm. We talked about that in the lecture. I'm just going to ignore that. There are the little three dots imply that there are some other ones as well. They're not even important enough to mention in the normal usage. Let's just ignore those. So if we submit this, what we should get down in the bottom from the interpreter is the calculation, the work that is done. For our vector three, two, one, we get an estimate to um, six decimal places of accuracy. Now, um, <clears throat> I do specify here in those comments that you can you can read a little bit about this. Let me demonstrate setting another argument though, since we're on arguments, because we we do this quite a lot, and we will do it in every one of these bootcamp pages. The first ones, while you're learning, you don't have to worry that 
um, it's all a bit mysterious. In use, this part will become second nature. <clears throat> but let's let's do it anyway. Well, what if we had a different vector? What if we had a vector that was like this vector, except that it was missing one value? The symbol for a missing value in R is in A. So I'm just going to submit that and it'll print it out down in the console. Three, two, one. See, it just prints the vector with the NA value that I've substituted for the 8.1. And then I'm going to try another call of the mean function, mean open bracket, x argument equals, and I'm going to paste in my new variable. Now, here's the first time that we see the butler peek around the curtain. Butler, I would like you please to calculate the mean of this vector with a missing value. Three, two, one. No, sir. I don't know what you mean. I won't I won't do that. In A. That's what you wanted, isn't it, sir? But no, that isn't what I wanted. I wanted the mean of the rest of those values. So that's where this little argument comes in. It's set to false by default. Remember what it asks. It's a logical value indicating whether NA value should be removed. And if they're left in, we'll get an error. This is a little idiosyncrasy, but it, it does affect a large number of variables. So we only have to use this once and it will apply to very many functions that we'll, we'll use continuously if you have missing data. So what can happen is um, this little bit is the value that I have set to the argument X. Remember that different arguments are, are separated by commas. So if I add a comma, just hit enter it makes it easier to read i don't have to hit enter but it just makes it easier to read and i specify the na.rm argument and remember the default is false but i'm going to set it to true this will remove that na value and um, give me a um, a mean calculation with it removed so i'll just do that now three two one mean is 5.2 it's much lower with the eight the largest value removed makes sense no complaints why would you not just leave that value out when you're typing it in rather than putting the na and then get, getting around it that way what's the logic what with a, a little piddly vector like this that only has um six values that's a good question you know you might just exclude it but what if you had a, a, a data sheet that had 2,000 rows and you just got an NA out? And then you'd have to go find it yeah. and, and remove it. So it's like one of those things that is so, so convenient when you need it. And it, it's, made for, it's made for catching every possibility. And this is, yeah, you're right. It's a stupid example. <laughs> no, 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 I didn't mean that. No, I'm just, uh, it was just popped in my head. I was like, why wouldn't you? But yeah, it totally makes sense. If you've got a large data set, it's a pain to go all, all the way through it. Yeah, yeah. Sure. That's that's exactly why. Yeah. And, and sometimes also you you may, when, when you remove it, <clears throat> if you're calculating other variables in a bigger in the context of a bigger data frame and you just exclude exclude the the rows then you have less rows and so yeah. then when you're estimating other things that you estimate with more rows it has another devious effect that you may miss so it's it's in there for a good reason good yeah question. very okay. good Thank you. um i will illustrate one other weird thing about r this is meant to make r easier to use but and I don't know if it does or not, but um, <clears throat> it's a fact that for most of the very most of the functions that we use day to day, like mean, like all of the functions we'll use day to day in our labs for the main module that you'll take with me. Um, I've formally specified the names of the arguments here because I think that's best practice and it's very, very clear. You know, there's no doubt that I'm setting this to the argument called x. There's no doubt that I'm setting this value to the argument called na.rm. But, but actually, um, for most functions, especially if uh, we look over here, the usage, 
what this usage implies once you um, get over the initial learning hump of R and, and look at a bunch of get comfortable to looking at help pages. What it implies is that you only need to set a uh, value to the X argument and everything else can be left at the default. Well, um, in a case like that, you can you can pass just the value to the argument and you don't have to specify the argument. So you can imply that I want to set the X to the one value that I sit there. I don't have to specify the X and I'll still get my answer out three, two, one. There it is. I find that a little confusing. I think it's best practice to specify all the arguments and yet it is easier to read um, by leaving it out. So that's just the last thing I have to say about arguments there. <clears throat> now I also said we're going to try out the box plot to, to plot the data. Box plot is um, special kind of plot. It was designed by, uh, I like this when I say this, I have encountered people in the past more than once. So it kind of sticks in my mind every time I mention the box plot. I'll tell you the story and then I'll tell you what I've encountered several times in the past. It was invented by a, a very famous and very well-respected statistician named George Box. And it, it's not just the, I'm going to go ahead and draw a picture of the box plot. I'm going to type out the box plot function. Box plot, open bracket, and in it I'm going to put my, my data. If I bring up the help page for box plot, it also has the argument X, so I can set the data to X, although it will work with the implicit um, vector set to X. What I've encountered, how do you find out if, he, if your data has NA values? Let me come back to that in just a moment. That's a good question too. <clears throat> is um, what I've encountered with George Box, though, is that the, somebody said they uh, they thought that, uh, oh, you're making that up. It's just a joke. It's a dad joke about George Box. But no, his name was really George Box. He really didn't invent the box plot. More than one person has accused me of just making that up as a stupid joke. I do make a lot of stupid jokes, but that's not one. So let's make the box plot. Now, the box plot is specific. George Box designed it to have hinges and edges to the box and a central line. The central line is the median, not the mean. The box edges are the first and third quartile of the data. So 50%, um, the middle 50% of your values fall in this range of the box. And these are the whiskers. And that, actually the box, I call them edges, but their technical name the name that George Box gave them is the hinges of the uh, box plot. These are the whiskers of the box plot. And um, they either are the range of your data. So our data range from two to eight, about eight, two to 8.1. Uh, or if you have a lot of data and some are unusually large, it may, um, the, the whiskers may go to the 95% confidence interval of the data. So now we've used the box plot. Now the question, any NA, that's a, um, let's go back to our um, NA data set. I'm just going to recycle my own code. That's the only time that it's, um, that it's um, okay to to uh, copy and paste is when you're recycling your own code. <clears throat> now, this is one of the things I love about R, is that I can, I can learn. I can continuously learn, even myself, and I find it fun. Let's try the old function that Matt says, not nay in A, any in A. Let's put our data in there, and it says true. So it does work. Um, but what do we get? <laughs> what does it mean? <laughs> um, I think that it says, I think this is asking, are there any NAs in the whole vector? So uh, we can look up the help page. So I've, I have actually literally never used the any NA function. It's new to me. So help any NA, let's bring it up. <clears throat> 
it looks like it's a suite of functions. So the one that I have used is in is dot na. So it's going to give us a vector of trues and falses for every value in there. So that tells you what what rows the row numbers that you have trues and falses in. Um, but yeah, any is any in a yeah. Do you have at least one in a in a vector in e in a? I'll have to remember it for next time. <laughs> But I, I I use a lot, and you might use a lot, is.na. Uh, and is.na tells you where those uh, NAs are. And then another one, just to answer your question really completely, Sophie, is one called uh, complete cases. Now, this may not work on just a humble vector, but it does. So complete cases. Um, is rather than telling us where the NAs are, uh, it tells us which ones don't have missing data. So notice the falses, they're false because they have data. And here are the trues, they're true because they have data. <laughs> so you oftentimes use complete cases on a data set to remove all the rows that have missing data. <laughs> OK, but I digress. <clears throat> So uh, I've got some challenges here. Let me wrap these around so they're easy for us to see. One is um, add a title to your box plot, to you box plot, misspelled. And uh, second is add an axis label to the Y axis. Now I'll let you guys um, look uh, into that, but this is another demonstration of what you can do with arguments, especially with plots. Um, there are a lot of aesthetic um, arguments that you might use. So let me just grab a, um, um, a vector of complete data, recycle, copy, and box plot. I'm going to set x equals to the data. <clears throat> now, the first challenge was to um, add a title. And if you, I'll, again, I'll let you practice with the help, but um, what I intend you to do here is uh, to use the main argument. Now the main argument is, um, here's a little shortcut. You can write this down on your R cheat sheet. If you want to bring up the help fast without bringing up the help menu, you can put your cursor in the name of the function and hit F1. It brings up the box plot function. And here we can just kind of scroll down. and see that there are an awful lot of arguments. Look at how many there are. You can spend all, all day long looking at them. And <clears throat> likewise, the usage, all we have to use for basic usage is the usage I did up front, and it'll make a box plot. But um, there's so much more that we can do. So the main argument writes a title right across the top. And uh, we have to use it in quotes. Now, it's funny, I wrote that little single quote from my own name. And uh, this is a little bit more of a technical technicality that I hope you don't have to fuss with. But um, <clears throat> we have to use an escape character to tell it. I don't mean that to be a, a syntax quote. I mean that to be a character. But what this main argument is, in fact, I'm just going to put uh, my box plot to to sidestep that we don't need to worry about. So I've put my box plot in quotes, could be double or single quotes, doesn't matter. And we'll make our box plot. <clears throat> and now I get this title over here, my box plot. <clears throat> A thing I want to demonstrate here, so when you're making an R plot, it's free to do a lot of little experiments and change it just a little bit each time. So the challenges are to add a title with the argument main and add an axis label. Now you can look in the help to see which axis label, but we'll we'll put it in the um, y axis label as the y lab argument, and we'll we'll make it something like uh, you know my variable. Oops, it didn't like that because I forgot my comma there. See how the um, Butler complained? It said it had an unexpected symbol, and I missed off my my comma there. So if I add the comma, three, two, one, boom, I get my my axis title now. <clears throat> uh, 
And we can put other ones as well. I'll just put my comma, enter, put color, my favorite color. What's my favorite color? Is anybody in, in the chat currently know my favorite R color? Goldenrod, correct. <clears throat> so there you go. You can add, you can go crazy with this and we just do little experiments to milk, build a great graph. Typically we don't want to use color and things unless it adds um, information. Typically we want the axis titles to be big enough to read. We want them to be in human language and not the scrubby defaults and so forth. Okay, so that does it for that code box. We've made our box plot. We're getting into our packages. We just learn a little bit about our packages. So no code in section 1.2.3. And then there's a little more code in 1.2.4. So um, if I go here in my script, here I didn't give the um, code for you, but uh, here I, um, <clears throat> I just demonstrate uh, how you install packages. Um, so you can get help on the function install packages. And we see that the, the main syntax for it is install.packages, name of the function. And then the packages arm argument is set to package name in quotes. And then we load it with the library function. So um, there are two ways to do this. In code, like I just demonstrated, or as this picture illustrates, and I'm just going to show you both ways in, uh, in real life. <clears throat> so if you're following along, you can take notes in your own script for this. So finding, downloading, and using packages. Well, I mentioned that finding packages is, is a challenge, um, especially when you start. But you will overcome that challenge because we'll use some packages all the time. And some of them we will want to download and install. I'll, um, I'll think of one that, uh, that I like. It's a little package, and I'll install it. <clears throat> So one that I like is called the PWR package for power. It's just a small little package. It's just cute. It does a cute little job that doesn't um, happen in the rest of the base packages in R. And I use it quite frequently just for little jobs. What the job is, I won't explain too much because I don't want to get off topic too much. I just really want to demonstrate how we load it. Now, the function I, I want to demonstrate on this is called the pwr.t.test. I don't think I've, in, I've just updated my R on this computer, and um, I don't actually think that um, I, I do have the PWR package installed, and the, the function pwr.t.test is inside the PWR package, and I haven't loaded it anyway. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask for help for pwr.t.test, and the butler it's going to tell me, never heard of it. Have no idea what you're talking about. No documentation. Okay, so <clears throat> what I'm going to do is I'm going to install dot packages pwr in quotes, and uh, now when I do that, some code down here will scroll by very quickly, and um, it's going to be in red. And uh, it's kind of funny because nothing's wrong, even though it's in red. Here, the red means everything's great. I'm just downloading the package you want, sir. So I'm going to do it. You can look down in the console area. Three, two, one. Oops. I've misspelled. See, it could not fall, find isntall.packages. So it gave me a little hint. Install. Three, two, one. There we go. The red means that everything is working great. And it says that the package PWR was successfully unpacked and that it's downloaded it and put it in my default library. <clears throat> so now that I have it local, it becomes a library. And I can just load it up, which I'm going to do. And what you'll see is it'll just echo my command, but I only tell it to load it. There's no output. So it'll just echo the command. You can watch three, two, one. And now if I ask for help with power.t.test, I'll get my help page. Three, two, one. There it is. The world is fine. Now the way, the second way to download, to install packages that's illustrated on that page, I'll just demonstrate live. <clears throat> and that's over here in the 
um, the help um, comes up in this lower right hand pane by default. You can change all this stuff around. I wouldn't recommend changing it around until you um, until you really have a good reason to, because all of the help material you're likely to come across will be the default settings. But uh, also the plots window is over here, and when you call help or a plot, it automatically brings that tab to the front. But there's also a tab called packages. And it's got all sorts of packages. Just look at them all. <clears throat> so these are all packages that I've already downloaded and have in my library. You'll have a lot of them in your R installation too, whether or not you've installed anything yet, because there are about 200 that come as, as standard. But um, instead of using the library function, you can just click. So uh, this is uh, the APE package, which I use a lot in my research. It's called Analyses of Phylogenetics and Evolution. Um, and if I click that, what you'll see down in the console is it will do exactly the same thing as if I execute the library command specifying the APE package. It will load it for me. So watch down here in the console when I click the radio button, three, two, one. It just loaded it, and now I have access to it. So this is a non-code way of loading packages. And notice this little install button over here. So if I click that, what I can uh, do is I can specify the name of a package I want to install. So it's a way to avoid using the install.packages function. For me, I'm more comfortable using install.packages for you. If you're more comfortable using this graphical way, by all means, do it. Anything that works for you. There is a thing that says install from, and uh, there are only two settings. One is install from CRAN, CRAN, the Comprehensive R Archive Network. Uh, and the other one says install from a local file, an archive file. <clears throat> I'm not going to go through the archive file you'll mostly want to stick to CRAN files unless you have a good reason not to. OK, so I'm just going to install a package for fun. I'm going to install the mass package. I probably already have it installed, but notice how I get the little text tool that comes up. So it will prompt me for all the different packages that have that character string in them. The one I want is just the plain old mass package. Tell it where to install it. And I just hit install. I've got the radio by default says to install dependency. Sometimes packages have other packages that they depend on. If you leave that installed, it'll install everything you need. So I click install. Now a lot of stuff is going to happen down here. Well, not that much stuff after all. So that's a that's a test drive on packages and on installing them and loading them. And then the last little bit is the practice exercises. Now, uh, what I intend you to do on these practice exercises is attempt to answer them yourself. If uh, you weren't in previous sessions when I've said this, it does frequently come up. And um, I'll just, I don't mind saying it over and over again, but I don't uh, provide full answers to these exercises. They're, they're meant for you to, to work to solve. And I don't like to give answers to them because then it, it's as if, especially when you're first learning, it, um, it is as if um, my answer is the only answer. But actually, there are 100 answers to every one of these. Many different ways you could choose to write your code, little variations. And I, I don't wish to give you an answer because the answer is not important. The important part is developing the practice of finding your own answer. So we'll work with you and support you to find your own answer uh, in here, like I'm about to show you. <clears throat> So um, I won't be uploading these answers, but the way I like to set up for these, so I'm going to copy and paste the questions into this little section. Then I'm going to comment them out so that they're nice to read in R so that we don't confuse the butler. <clears throat> I'm just going to make them so they don't wrap on the screen so we can all read them together by wrapping them around. And then I'm going to select it, and I'm going to hit my hotkey Control plus shift plus C. That's the automatic code to comment out everything I've selected. Boom. Okay. 
<clears throat> one, explain in your own words what the freak argument in the hist function does. It often helps to practice trial and error. I say trail and error, found another little typo in my own script, uh, to understand what's happening with the data. Try experimenting with this data vector with the hist function to explore the freak argument. Okay, so I, I tell you right away what to do. And I'm going to do one way of answering this question that is a playful way. It's very effective in R. It's very effective when you're learning. Kim, it's always frustrating to be learning a new programming language, but um, one way to learn this is just to try it on. So I've told you what function, and I've told you to try the freak argument, but why don't we just see it without messing about first? So that's what it does. Um, with the uh, freak argument. <clears throat> now, I haven't specified anything with the freak argument. I said use the help. I'm going to use that little trick where I click on the name and hit F1, three, two, one. And down here it says, um, under my default usage, and just to remind you, got the name of the pack, the name of the function, and the um, name of the package, what it is makes histograms. Here's a longer description. It's a generic function that computes histograms. All a histogram does is it categorizes the counts, which is called the frequency of observations that are in certain categories. If we just look at the plot here, it's got the number of my observations. Here are my observations. It's got the number of them that fall between one and two. So two of them fall between one and two. It's got the number that fall between two and three, two of them fall between two and three, it's two threes, and so forth. <clears throat> now somewhere, I, and I don't know what the default is, I actually don't know it, there's a cutoff. So it, one of these bins, these dividing lines, ends at exactly 2.0, and it'll be just anything above 2.0 in the other bin. I don't know which way direction it goes uh, at the moment, but uh, we want to exploit the freak function. So go back to our help. <clears throat> if we look under the usage, we see right away that um, there's a simple usage, or just like we used it, we've just specified the x argument. But th then we have a more complex usage with a lot of the argument names, and freak is right there. And by default, it's set to null. So if we scroll down to the um, arguments dictionary and we find the freak definition, we say that it's logical. And if it's true, the histogram graphic is a representation of frequencies. And if it's false, it's of densities, probability densities. And that just means the proportion of observations that fall in those bins. So we can sort of set that. So if it's <clears throat> We already know at the one that we've already made, if we go back to our plots, that it, the default is frequency, even when it's set to null. And it was true that it calculates the frequency. So if I do this, this graph shouldn't change. Keep your eye on the graph. Make sure it doesn't change in any little way. Three, two, one. And it didn't seem to change in any little way. But now I'm going to change this to false. So keep your eye on this axis. You're going to um, you're going to look for any little change. What I think is going to change. I like to do this as a little way that I interact with R, and I actually do it in other ways too. I like to compare what I think is going to happen with what actually happens. Challenge my model of how I think the world works with how the world actually works. What I think is going to happen is this y-axis is going to change to density. And these numbers are going to change from counts, from the frequency, to a proportion. And it looks like we have uh, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 11, 16 values. Uh, and so 2 divided by 16 is going to be right there where the 2 is. So let's uh, keep your eye on the code. 3, 2, 1. And there we go. Um, We've changed the density and the proportions. So we can see the biggest proportion, about a third of our data, um, is uh, between four and five. 
So that really answers that question. If you uh, type in your own words, what uh, what the function of the frequency argument does on the histogram. Now I'll do one more question. <clears throat> And then we'll decide how we're going to spend some of the rest of this time tonight. Number two, tailor your code from the hist example in problem one so that your histogram has a main title, axis labels, and set the call argument for color to blue. We're just scratching the surface with plot customization. Try to incorporate other arguments to make an attractive graph. So um, <clears throat> what it said was to tailor our code. That's shorthand for you're allowed to copy and recycle your own code. Um, so that as a main title, so we'll set a main. And we'll um, <clears throat> set the uh, axis labels. So I'm going to leave the frequency to false. So, um, you know, you can look in the help yourself, but I'll just let you know that the Y label axis argument is called Y lab. It's the same way for every plot function as well. And we could set an x-axis label as well. And I'm just going to put categories. That'll remove that ugly. Usually it would put the name of a variable that you have a vector in, but it because we passed the ugly raw vector, it did something like that. I'll show you how to get around that in a moment. So in matter of fact, I'll just show you real quickly that uh, typically we, we probably wouldn't actually pass a raw vector like this. We'll start doing this method in the next boot camp, but typically we might just call this a variable name, put that value in the variable name, and then set x equal to our variable name. And then it would change the, um, the x title to the name of that variable. I think the last one I said was um, the color argument. What's Ed's favorite color in R? Of course, we're going to use sweet, sweet goldenrod. There we go. So this would be a one possible answer for, for this question. <clears throat> now, is this, um, is this kind of stuff fun for you? We don't have time to do all of these so slowly because we only have um, a week and a half now, and we have 11 of these uh, boot camps to get through. So we'll have to pick up the pace, and we only have one more session after tonight. So how would we like to best use the rest of the session tonight? Got to have some feedback here. <clears throat> I could finish these examples. Uh, we could do breakout rooms. If you have tried some uh, exercises for the pages after this one or before this one or even indeed on this one and you're having trouble get through them. Does true and false have to be capitals? That's a good question. <clears throat> um, yeah, if you have a, a, um, a true and false, now the, the words all capitals in, in R, true and false, have a special meaning. So uh, let me let me make a little variable. I'll call it variable two because I only made I already made variable one. I'll make a little note to myself, and I'll say, you know, what if I made a vector that had some um, some stuff in it that. Um, <clears throat> That was like uh, one, three, five, seven, nine. OK, 
Okay, just a couple of numbers, and I set that to variable two. We can print out variable two down there. Three, two, one. Here we go. And then, um, <clears throat> and then um, I wanted to do a test about whether which, which one of those in that string were um, true or false, bigger than bigger than one. Which one of those are bigger than one? So I could ask ver2 greater than one. And I get those the default in R for these true false binary values are the all capital um, true false values. <clears throat> now you can short, shorten them quite right that Ashley said that you can shorten them to uh, T or F. We can kind of demonstrate that with the Maybe the histogram argument is an easy one to do it with. <clears throat> we can, um, <clears throat> if we do this one and we see that we have our density graph back, we can pass false and watch the graph, see if it changes three, two, one. Let's try some other value like false, three, two, one. Okay, so this time false is not found. And um, false also stands for zero, and true stands for one. So let's see if it will also accept zero, three, two, one. So it does also accept zero, in which case it should also accept one for true, three, two, one. Watch the y-axis. Yes. So you can either use capital T or F, capital T-R-U-E and F-A-L-S-E, or zero and one. They all mean exactly the same thing and their use is reserved as a special reserved variable names in R. You have to be careful in R though, because unlike some other computer names, the passive aggressive Butler will allow you to change the meaning of big T and big F <laughs> and true and false. But we best forget we even heard Ed say that. Okay. So uh, I heard one vote for maybe working quietly in a couple of breakout rooms. How many of us are left after this evening? There are not that many of us left. Um, so I think if we have, um, <clears throat> we, we have quite a lot of demonstrators here tonight. <laughs> um, we have, we have um, almost one demonstrator per student. <laughs> so, um, do we want to stay in one main room with this many students, or would it be nice? Uh, can we have a little bit of a vote or an opinion? Is it okay to stay in the same same room, or do we want to uh, do breakout rooms with smaller groups? Demonstrators can have an opinion on this too. Anybody have uh, anything? I could make a couple of breakout rooms, or stay in this room. One room's fine. Matt had like a really good problem um and it was on i don't i don't know if you want to go through it it's based on the linear, oh, yeah. linear regression one um, it's, it's it not was, for now george i appreciate you stepping in but it's from you know we're doing like one point x stuff at the moment really i'm thinking about the students in particular okay um I mean, I can ask it. Uh, do, 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 do you want me to just say what it was, Ed? I mean, I, yes, spit it, it out. It's not on the screen. I was in. Give, I was just doing problem. two point. Two give me point. A um, Come on. I'm, I'm anxious. I'm desperate. Okay. okay. Um, I think it's probably the easiest. Can I share my screen? I can quickly show you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, where's the. Is there a request to. It's, it's the little. Okay, there it is. There it is. Okay. So, uh, screen. Uh, where are we? Uh, let's go to R. Um, can you see this? Yep. Yep. Okay. So, so basically, I just couldn't work out what um, uh, 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 one of the lines was being used for. So this one. In fact, I commented it out. I mean, I, I realised what this does. You know, it creates. Um, you know, if I run it, we, we'll we'll see X appear in the global window, and just as you'd expect. Um, and in fact, in the original text, it was minus one to plus one, and I just changed it to see what the effect was. And 
and I couldn't see an effect. So then, then I, I removed it altogether, and the uh, this denorm function still worked in the same way. So I couldn't really work out what this x did, and I did look at the help function, and I didn't really understand it. So maybe that's something we could do together: is just look at the um, where are we? Oh, I haven't got an F1 key, would you believe? Let me just have a quick look. Uh, function F1. There we go. So uh, so it's this one, isn't it? Denorm. And then it just says here, X and Q, vectors of quantiles. Yeah. Let, let me just tell you verbally what it does, because this is kind of a very advanced question if everybody's um, tootling around on the early pages, but let me say verbally what it does because this is this is a nice thing to help understand about um, fitting curves. <clears throat> so what that C, what the seek function does, seq, short for sequence. You can figure out. You already figured out empirically what it does do. It uh, has three arguments there. It has the beginning of a range, the end of a range, and here the beginning is minus ten and the end is plus ten. And the by argument tells you to make a sequence of numbers from the beginning to the end, and it tell the by argument sets the increment. So from negative 10 to positive 10, I want you to make me one number that um, increases incrementally by 0 0.02. So it'll be minus 10. You can see it in the window there, minus 9.98, minus 9.96, and it does that all the way up to positive 10. The next one, what it does, uh, can you just run run the code to make the uh, graph? Have you okay. already made the graph? Yeah, yeah, hang on. Uh, so first of all, so what we're doing is we, we're doing a histogram, which does tie in nicely with what we've been doing. Yeah. So we've got a histogram, and we want to see if that's got the, the lovely bell curve on it. Yeah. Um, so this is the code that actually puts the, uh, the blue, yeah, the ideal Gaussian just, just there. That's perfect. That's perfect. Yeah. So what you, what you've done there in that little uh, expression <clears throat> is um, the gray bars there are just a histogram, exactly like the histogram we just made of uh, of some real data. And what the blue line represents is if those data were um, perfectly adhered to the Gaussian distribution, the bell-shaped curve. Sometimes people call that the normal distribution, but as you'll find out when you when you get through the rest of my bootcamp pages, I don't like it. The word I don't like calling it the normal distribution because that implies that it's typical and it is not typical for some kinds of data. So the Gaussian um, distribution is the proper way to call it. <clears throat> so this is the Gaussian curve that would be the perfect Gaussian distribution for for the same exact data that had the same exact mean and the same exact um, variance. And the way that that is created is um, I've exploited this, um, this feature of the, the D norm function is a function that is um, a density function for the Gaussian. Of course, even, even the creators of R called it the normal curve, but uh, statisticians just can't have that. <clears throat> so, we take our range on the X uh, and we want it to be very fine. So I set the, the uh, range of the X to go from um, to go from uh, a very, very small number to very large across the range of what the residuals could possibly be. I went way beyond what's actually displayed there. So there actually aren't any values that are displayed there um, that are less than negative two and less than positive two. And I, but I've just made it very wide, just in case. That would work for almost any histogram function. And then I fit the density curve to that with the curve function. So it just sets the resolution for that density norm function to fit a curve against. And you could, okay. ex you could experiment with the increment. Like, yeah. if you, let's, let's just do it right now. Change okay. 0.02 to 1 or something like that, just change it to one and run that uh -huh. and run the curve again. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Did you run it? Uh, yeah. 
Yeah, this is this is what I found is when even if I completely delete X and run it, it nothing changes. That's that's what I was confused by. Yeah, yeah, maybe I was just going overkill on uh, how much of the fine grain that you needed, but that's what it's doing. Yeah, all right, <laughs> it's running right. against that range. Okay, cool. Thanks a lot. No problem. Okay, uh, I'm just going to make some rooms now. Uh, we'll make, um, since there's a, just a small number of us, we'll just make two rooms, I think, so that there's, um, let's see how many of us there are in here, how many students there are. So, yeah, I'm just going to make two rooms. That'll be three or four people in each room. So, uh, just, it'll take me a, a few agonizing moments to make this. <laughs> I'll get better at making these, I swear. Eventually, there we go. Here we go. I'm going to make two rooms. I'm going to randomly allocate. Ah. Going to delete that one. Delete that one. My goodness, the, these breakout rooms are, um, I think they're, they're quite good. And they are fairly easy to, uh, to use, but they, um, they take a lot of time to, um, to do. I'm going to go ahead and end the recording here as well, since we're going to breakout rooms. Let me do that first so I don't blather on in the recording.